<laughs> you ready? Yes. Okay, here we go. Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to vlog one, two, three. How special is this? Uh -huh. New voices new publishing and I'm not in Adelaide I'm in a very very glamorous place can I say I'm in <laughs> Bingley in Yorkshire and it's a lovely lovely place and we're going to have a really provocative remarkable conversation with a remarkable woman that is sitting next to me so Philip Grant is unbelievably getting married in three days <laughs> yes I'm so three excited. days yeah. and so she's actually taken some time back from her holidays <laughs> in this tragic scary week before you get married to be it be with us and talk with us at this time so we are so <laughs> grateful you are very precious well i would not miss this chance to to meet you, Tara, and to oh. be interviewed by you. Oh, well, Philippa, you've been so important to us, and we'll, we'll talk about the importance of a great editor, and you certainly are that person, and the expertise that we're going to use today. And look at the prep she's done and everything, it's all a bit <laughs> frightening. But what I, what I want to use is I want to use Philippa's expertise to talk about the transformations in publishing to enable and support your career. So Philippa is the editorial director um, of social science, including sociology, criminology, and social policy. Uh, yeah, those are the areas I look after, yeah. And all, all the juicy stuff is there. All the stuff of life, the interest, the intrigue, the passion, the really edgy scholarship is in this area. So she's doing a remarkable job. And we're in Emerald Publishing Group. So Emerald is a really fascinating company. We might talk a little bit about that on the way through too. But it, it's a great place and it's an important place. And I'm thrilled to actually visit a publisher like we used to in the old days. No one ever does this anymore, but actually to come to a publisher, a physical location, and see the work that you do has been really quite inspirational. So I'm gonna be honest here, Emerald is my favorite publisher at the moment, and they're producing some of the most edgy work I am seeing on this planet right now. And when I was prepping this vlog this week, I was thinking about the great moments in publishing, you know, when you get really excited. Like in the 1980s, Rutledge were producing these remarkable books in cultural studies. I'm much older than you, but we'll be so excited when these books would arrive. And it's like every book would like change the planet, just move the axis of the world a little bit. And in the 1990s, I think Ashgate Publishing did a similar job. They were provocative and they had a go and they published new voices and they changed scholarship before because of it. And I would also argue that Emerald is now the publisher in the 2010s that is fulfilling that role. So that's why I'm here. So I want to use your expertise. I'm not bulldusting. That's exactly what I think. So I want wow. to use Philip's expertise to help us all think about the transformations in publishing. So Philip has worked at Palgrave, maintains a relationship still with Spring and Nature. Uh, no, no, no. I'm, I work for Emerald. Uh, but you did have a... a but I worked at Palgrave previously. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And then Palgrave were taken out, were merged with Springer. Springer. So, yeah. Yeah, Remark so. But again, that's quite important because also Spring and Nature have just taken over the universe as well, haven't they? Yeah, yeah. Huge publishing yeah, yeah. conglomeration. Yeah. And she also, and this is the bit of the story that I really, really love, she completed her PhD at Manchester University in history and also completed a bachelor and master's in history at the University of Manchester. So the best people, as you know, have history degrees. <laughs> Uh, and the best people have degrees from Manchester University. <laughs> so you are amazing. So hello. Hello. <laughs> I am so thrilled to be sitting with you today. It means so much to me because we've sort of emailed and talked like, like we're sort of friends for like eight, about 18 months. And finally to see <laughs> yeah, you yeah. Well, is, it's is remarkable. It's an absolute delight and pleasure to meet you too. Oh, well, and of course the first question is about you because you are a fascinating person in and of yourself. <laughs> You completed your PhD in 2002, I believe. Yeah. Now, from that moment, how did you move into publishing? So how did that movement occur, just in terms of career advice and insight for our students? Yeah, well, so I started my PhD. Um, I loved my MA. I started my PhD. Uh, it was very exciting, but I fairly quickly probably realised it wasn't going to be the career for me. So I wanted to finish my PhD, but kind of while I was doing that, I was kind of looking around to see what else I might do that still kept me in touch with the academic world. 
and I was always really interested actually in the in the books themselves and how they came into being and the idea of working possibly with a, a range of different people working on a range of different topics and you know like you I was always a huge fan of whatever Routledge had published yeah. you know if it was a Routledge book it had that mark in those days you know this was in the 90s when I was doing my mm-hmm. PhD you know so I was I don't know, so I was always aware of, of the publishers. So um, as I came to the end of, of my PhD, um, uh, being at Manchester, I actually applied to do an internship at Manchester University Press. The beautiful Manchester University yes, Press. Yes, the amazing Manchester University Press. Um, and while I was waiting for my internship to come up, a part-time job came up as an editorial clerical assistant which <laughs> was a job just looking after um, contributor contracts. Wow. So that's all I did <laughs> all, all day. So I applied for that job and I got that job and, and um, uh, then, then a, a maternity role came up to be an editorial assistant. Um, then a job came up at Routledge, uh, which I applied for, and so for me, you know, that was amazing. That yeah. that quickly, I was I was working for kind of my dream publisher. Um, so really, you know, you need to do even with a PhD, you need to do that editorial assistant role first because that's where you really learn the the nuts and bolts of, yes. of how publishing works before you then progress to a commissioning role. Um, but I loved it straight away, and I, I loved what you know I'd always thought I would love, which is the op- getting to work with academics all around the world. You know, I I started off working on history, but very quickly moved on to commissioning sociology and getting to yeah. see across the whole discipline. You know, one minute I'm talking to people about migration studies, the next it's social. You know, the effects of austerity and and social policy. Oh. Um, so you're working on or it's deviant, gender, leisure. deviant leisure, or of deviant course. Deviant leisure or metal music studies or death studies. Yes. So you know you you know you're and and I love I love that moment where someone tells you their idea and it's like that zing moment, that excitement that I used to get when you would read those yeah. you know people like Judith Butler or Foucault back yeah. in the nineties. So. Wow. So I love that. Well, isn't it isn't that inspirational? <laughs> Firstly, I didn't know that trajectory getting into publishing that, you know, from a PhD, and there's a real life lesson there, you know, I mean, 60% of our PhD students won't work in higher education. Oh, wow. So that we're now right. at 60%. Wow. So this is a great model. And it is interesting that you took a part-time job mm. as an editorial assistant, mm. then did some mat leave, yeah. and then were able to get, get a post in that way. So that's yeah. confidence. But that's also commitment from you, I think. Yeah, you have to do. You have to go in at that entry level. You know, even with all your years of study behind you, I think it really stands you in good stead for for the your your career through publishing to know the nuts and bolts and you know the day to day and the admin of, of how it how it that's, works. And just sort of a subordinate question there. Therefore, has the PhD helped you in publishing? Um. I think it helps. Um, it helps in terms of um, what? How do I describe it? Um, uh, in presenting myself, say to new authors, that's that, right. that, that I have that PhD, um, and therefore I, I kind of might have a bit more kind of understanding yes. about that world, or sympathy for that world, or perspective on that world. So I think it sort of helps me, it helps me as a commissioning editor. Um, and certainly as an I academic mean, who's worked with you, of, it's made a huge difference. And in terms of kind of, oh, sheer just grit and <laughs> willingness to get knuckled down and do the work that, you know, yeah. having done a PhD, those kind of things help. Um, you know, and, and that you know, for me, it, working in academic publishing is a bit of a vocation. It's not just a job, which I think also you know comes from having done my PhD. 
and right. can I just say, as someone who works with you as an author, um, it's made an incredible difference because you are a scholar in and of yourself, you are a brilliant human being, and that makes an incredible difference when you're dealing with academics you know, still in the field. So it does make a difference, it really does. You are a brilliant person. I also want to talk about, because you've got a lovely trajectory, I come in a bit earlier, but you've got a lovely trajectory through publishing and academic publishing, and I wonder the changes that you are seeing in terms of digitisation and sort of acceleration, if you will, of publishing multiple modes and modalities. Can you give us some shape on that about the changes to publishing you've seen? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think the biggest change has been um, open access and the move towards open access and that this is um, being mandated by funders and governments now um, you know and I think that's really exciting for academic publishing and its ability to to reach out beyond just academic audiences and, and have a, a broader impact so I, I'd say you know that's one of the main Huge. the main shifts um, uh, you know and it's 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 still quite quite slow um, on the book side but we're seeing more and more books being published open access uh, and I think that you know that's re a really exciting development. I think um, uh, some s we've also seen um, that the digital publishing has allowed for new formats too. So that the short form book that so many academic oh, publishers yeah. are producing now was really born out of, was really born as a digital first publication, and the idea that you didn't need. Um, you weren't constrained anymore by print and print uh, book length, yeah. uh, being able to publish online. Um, and so being able to publish research that was uh, you know, a bit longer than a journal article, but not quite book length, uh, has been, uh, you know, that has been taken up by social scientists in particular. Oh, it's huge. Um, and they're great to read too, aren't they? Because you get the sort of slam of ideas, it's superb. And I think they, they offer, they have the potential to offer, as a new format, it has potential to offer new ways of writing yeah. or even doing research. Yeah. Um, so I think it's, it can be quite, quite a creative format as well. One of the first books I published in that format was with Kath Woodward, who's a, a British sociologist. She is. Um, and she, she did the research for the book during the Olympics in 2012. She wrote the book uh, in about two months after that, and so the Olympics was August, and we published the book in October. So I think that it was just such a creative use of that format. It was really oh. exciting to be involved in that book. And it's funny, I knew, I mean, because your point series, I think, is incredibly important in that narrative. I knew these small books would take off, and you know, now just about every publisher has them. Yeah. They, do you think there's a bit of a different audience, or do you think it's, do you think they're a bit broader in terms of a general audience for these shorter books? Um, I think they have. I really think they have the potential to be, especially mm. for trying to reach policy maker audiences for example um, and the other the other thing we're doing so I think I mean a lot of the time that kind of book is still an academic work yes um, but we've also published a short book series called society now yeah, which um, uses the same uh, kind of idea of books at around 50,000 words they can publish in three months and the idea of that series is really to take the expertise that academics have to explain what's happening in our world today because it seems we are going through some really complicated interesting times so you're um, a classy woman too complicated interesting times <laughs> i would have used different discourse there but but that's a, and so you want that intervention if you are a public intellectual you want that intervention to broaden it out a little bit more yeah yeah so we've published on brexit on trump i mean we've also published on selfies yep. um and we've seen uh, some really nice review coverage and some really good sales of those books um so so that's that's been an exciting use of that short book format. Yes. So that's fantastic. So open access is important. I think the diversity of publishing, what publishing now looks like in terms of book length and form is incredibly important. I think what else is, has been really exciting is the way that academics are using social media as well. Um, and that, you know, the, especially something like Twitter, 
um, blogs as well, but in particular how they're using Twitter, how they're communicating on Twitter, what that might mean for uh, kind of making a wider impact with their research. It means that as a publisher, we have more direct access to a kind of more, um, we can reach academics in a more direct way. Yeah. They can engage with us in different ways as well. Very wise. Um, and it really helps us to stay in touch with academic communities um, and, and stay close to our academic communities, see the, the issues that really matter to them beyond publishing, see how we can how we might support academics kind of more in the round. So something like the Immodest Women campaign at the moment. Yes. It's fantastic to see that. And that's magnificent because, <laughs> again, that's broadening out the public discourse. And that's what we need, you know, the public good. We don't use that phrase enough. Mm. And it's amazing that we've got, you know, commercial publishers, commercial academic publishers that are doing that work. But what you've just helped us with there is enormous. So that disintermediation, that direct relationship between academics and publishers, yeah. between academics and their audiences, between publishers and their audience, that flattened model. Yeah. And also I talk to our guys all the time about that triangulation of your research. So just publishing is not enough. You then have to take the next step and find your audience. Don't assume yeah. the audience is going yeah. to come to you. Yeah. You find yeah. that audience. So yeah. you're finding that as well. Oh yeah, I mean absolutely. For if you you're wanting to publish for a wider audience beyond academia, you we talk about author platform the whole time. So awesome that's platform. absolutely vital. And it's never been in a way. It's never been easier to build start building an author platform via social media. Um, and some of the authors that we've published that you know, have had uh, you know, sales beyond academia and are reaching, and their work is reaching a more general audience, you know, they have excellent social media profiles. Yeah. So that's, author platform. Yeah. That's my new thing. Author yeah. platform. Yeah. I'm going to put that on T-shirts. I'm going to put that anywhere. <laughs> author platform. That's really crucial. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And yeah. social media is a way to do that. So use that phraseology. So when you're doing book publishing and, and proposals, mm. start to think about author platform. Who knew? That's unbelievable. Mm. Now, another question about you, but I think there's also a meta question about the nature of publishing too, Philip, and that is you move from Palgrave to Emerald. Now, that's a courageous decision, a remarkable decision. In career terms, you know, I'm terribly impressed with you as a woman to do something as courageous as that. Why did you make that move? Well, in 2015, um, I'd been at Palgrave for 10 years by then, um, and they merged, and I, I loved working with Palgrave. We did a lot of really exciting yeah. work at Palgrave, um, built the social sciences team there. But in 2015, they merged with Springer. And for me, that meant a different direction for the press and a different approach and a different strategy. Um, and I had the opportunity to take up a, a very similar role as that I'd had at Palgrave here and that just seemed too exciting an opportunity to, to miss to me. Um, Emerald um, had been, uh, been publishing journals for 50 years um, and had dabbled in book publishing. They were known for their databases too particularly weren't they? I mean I certainly, my first experience with them was about I suppose 95 when they were oh, doing a lot okay. of those, I'm assuming the, the big sort of triangulated you know, databases of journals as well. Oh, I first heard okay. of like that. Okay, yeah, and business and management had been yes. their main focus as well. Um, so the opportunity here was to set up a new social science books program and working with um, a mid sized independent publisher outside of the southern bubble as well, which is also interesting to do. Um, and it's very rare in academic publishing that you get to to start from scratch, really, and to 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 shape your own program. And look, I can see the excitement. I hope you can see the excitement <laughs> in her eyes too. The idea that you can start something—I mean, it's it's an incredible achievement of what you've done. It's an incredible achievement, and it is yours, and you have built it, and it is changing scholarship. So I just hope you know, as sort of this person that's coming and seeing you today, you take that as feedback because what you've done is remarkable. Well, and it is yours. Well, I think what we, so about, at that time, about six of us came over yeah. from Powergrave to work in various different departments in the books, within books, so in sales, in marketing, and in, in the, on the editorial side. And I think for those people, 
who came from Palgrave, what we saw at that point was the loss of the mid-sized publisher. So whereas, so where Palgrave and Ashgate, both in 2015, yeah. uh, kind of merged or taken over by yep. the large corporates, yep. um, you have, at the other end, you've got really exciting, I think, rise, return of the university press. I mean, I'm talking from a very UK perspective yep. as well. But, um, but it is generalisable. It's a good okay. point. I think you guys are ahead. Our university presses are a bit more tentative, but you are seeing a bit of a bit of growth again. So yes, and the you know the, the university presses focusing on open access. That's very exciting. But what I think is then you miss that mid-sized publisher. And for me, um, size matters in this scenario because I think you can do the best of both worlds. A generalisable <laughs> principle, right? Generalisable <laughs> principle. Yep. I think you get the best of both worlds as a mid-sized publisher. Yeah. You've got um, the global reach of the large corporates, but yeah. you still can have that personal, bespoke um, focus of the smaller presses. And I think that comes together really nicely with the mid-sized publisher. I think that's what Palgrave was really good at, yeah. and, I, and that's what we're trying to do here and, and, you, and you are succeeding and we'll talk about it a little bit in a second but that direct relationship that an author has with an editor is a very precious special relationship and as my wonderful late husband Steve should say you've got to cherish it when you find it because they're so incredibly rare and you are one of those people. <laughs> now I've been incredibly impressed by Emerald. I mean, you're going to be publishing at least a few of my books in the next few <laughs> years at least, <laughs> for, for which I'm very grateful. Um, so I'm publishing with you, obviously. Steve discovered you first and produced Theoretical Times with this wonderful publisher. And you know that book, wherever I go, people say, oh look, I'm reading it now. So clearly <laughs> the sales are going incredibly well. And, and he was so proud to work with you and was so impressed by that final book. Now I've found Emerald, and I use these as really important words, e.g. provocative, at the cusp and the edge of knowledge. You guys have committed to interdisciplinarity. So was there a conscious decision, maybe that period when your colleagues came from Palgrave, that as a publisher you were going to go into that different, e.g. sort of provocative academic environment? As an organisation, was it a decision to go a bit edgy? Well, I think, you know, there are a lot of established academic publishing brands out there that people are loyal to, and in a kind of pragmatic uh, way, we need to grab people's attention and <laughs> yeah. um, show that we're here. So if we can do something a bit different, then um, I, think it's, um, I think it's good to do that. Um, uh, you know, I definitely felt that... that that you know, coming back to that idea of the mid-sized publisher, I, I, re I really passionately believe that that is a really good format. That's the best type of publisher for authors, really. Um, and when I first, so when I first started in 2016, I spent a lot of time going out onto campus and meeting with authors and talking with them about what they liked about the publishers they worked with, what they didn't like, what they felt Emerald could could offer wow. and um, you know and we've used a lot of that feedback to to shape what we're doing I think um, and uh, an ongoing as we as we develop we're still we're still drawing on 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 that feedback wow. so you know we want to be um, a kind of the scholar's friend to give it maybe a bit yeah. of a cheesy <laughs> that, that, that's not in ruthless times when authors are being ripped off left right and centre by just about everybody mm. to have a, a decent relationship with anybody with a with a human being mm. as an academic is a, is a powerful thing so that, oh, right. that does make a real difference and you know the areas you've gone into I mean you know, deviant leisure is a great one you've actively cho you know death studies I mean wow <laughs> yeah, fantastic. So you've actively chosen these quite provocative at the edge of knowledge. And I, I just hope you're going to gain from that, you know? <laughs> well, I think that's a... I, I really enjoy doing that. If we can support under-published under areas and in, in any kind of small way help those research fields to develop and grow, yeah. know, that is, as a, as a publisher, as a commissioning editor, that's a really exciting thing to be able to do so yeah so we've set up um got a couple of series uh, three series actually on death studies um a series on <laughs> sociology of reproduction yes. which i'm really excited about 
uh, yeah, and the metal music study series. <laughs> We've got a lot um, of death metal crew on on the Flinders campus, obviously. <laughs> oh, well, I, sp- I, wish, I wish I was joking. Sure. <laughs> there are some death metal crew. This is um, the place too. And we've also got a series called um, Emerald Studies in Alternativity and Marginalisation, which um, you know I think in a way is a is a bit of a flag bearer for you know come and come and join us and and, and do something different. I mean that's not to say um, I don't want to publish in the heartlands of of from my areas of sociological research as well. But uh, yeah, definitely if we can publish and be a home for areas that feel a bit underpublished, then that's, I think that's really exciting. But you know, as well, I also think academia is the exciting and edgy place. You know, what we do is just reflect that. Academia is 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 the dynamic, edgy part here. Well, <laughs> well I, I, I hope you're right. And I, I want to be that person. You know, I want to be in, in an academia that is edgy and provocative. I think so often we fall short, mate, and I think that's the tragedy. And, and also maybe we fall short because we're not able to publish in these edgy areas. We, we're continually drawn back to the core particular research areas you yeah. know, because that seemed to be credible. Well, at the end of the day, at the end of your life, you, do, you, do you really want to be remembered as credible or do you want to be remembered as fabulous? <laughs> <laughs> and I think you want to be remembered as fabulous, you know, credible, you know, we'll just put on a smoking jacket, wear a bit of corduroy and hope for the best. But actually, you know, if you've actually transformed something, and, and I always think maybe it's the partnership, and you and I talking about this has sort of made me realise this, that would popular cultural studies have existed without Ashgate's commitment? And I think it was this beautiful sort oh, wow. of symbiotic relationship that, yeah. that, that came together. And I think you're doing the same thing. You're picking these wonderful fields, or the fields are picking you, and together you're provocatively opening out these new fields. Wow. So I think that's what you're doing, to be honest with but you. But it makes me... I, I get very bemused, and it saddens me to hear academics kind of talk about this relationship with publishers as a very fractious, oh. difficult one. I've had to sell several organs <laughs> with some publishers. Well, we might talk about that. So it's, it, the, the, the good publishers I've worked with, I could put on, you know, finger, literally fingers in one hand, University of New South Wales Press, where I got my start. So they just picked a, a random manuscript up and published me. So that's just, you know, that first book is always the hardest book. Um, Ashgate and you guys. Wow. They're the, they're the wow. three. They're the three. The rest have been like, I've had to lose an organ. Wow. To, get, to get published, mm. yeah. So yeah, I mean, I just don't think it needs to be this way. <laughs> no, no, so, no. C- civility and scholarship requires other things of us, I think. Mm. But let's also talk about how fabulous is <laughs> um, Let's all also talk about e-books. I know this is sort of an emerging area that no one really knows what's going on in some ways, but e- I backed e-books really early on when, they, when, they, when I was still writing for the Times Higher Education. I could see the e-books coming. I went... That's going to be a thing. That is going to be a thing, and it is going to work. Now it's had some dips. How many times have people said ebooks are failing? Ebooks are failing. Well, they haven't. So I just wonder how you're feeling about the ebook titles. I'm reading probably more ebooks now than conventional books, and I read a oh, lot of all sorts of books. Okay. But are they different sorts of books, and are they different sorts of audiences? Do we know? Um, I don't think they are different sorts of books and different sorts of. Audience, particularly in in academic publishing, I think what you what's happened in academic publishing is there was a huge initial boom and interest in ebooks and a lot of excitement about them, which has um, leveled out now. And actually, what we're seeing now is a resurgence of print on the academic side, yes. which is interesting. Um, but I think I don't, I don't think acad- uh, ebooks are going anywhere. I definitely think they're here to stay. I think what that shows is it's, it's not really the delivery mechanism that matters. It's about the content. Yeah. Um, and there's still um, interest and enthusiasm for the content. And yeah. ebooks is just another way to access that content. I think that's fantastic. And I, I, I want to also, with the shortened books, also yeah. have that. I, just, I, I don't know. See, there's no research on this yet, so that's why I'm sort of yeah. asking, Philip, and we'll just try and work it out together. But I'm just wondering if, because the shortened books, they are short, a bit groovy, they're on, they're on your iPad, it's all rocking, mm. um, whether that's a more intimate relationship rather than the long book, which obviously you would read by paper. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think um, e-books have allowed, allowed that short form 
to exist. Yeah. Uh, so that, in, on the academic side, has been a really exciting development. Um, so, yeah, that's been... A thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it is a thing. And also, of course, I have been doing work on this in the last... But audio books are also back in a huge way. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I may convince you whether or not we might do yeah, an audio yeah. book for well, Trump academic, studies. Yeah, academic, pub, academic publishing hasn't really explored the audio book very much. So, But all of a sudden they've gone bombers yeah, in the last podcast, five years. Yeah, podcast. Actually, there was a report in the bookseller recently to say um, that non-fiction is, is really having a resurgence at the moment. Yeah. So where in the early noughties it was the celebrity memoir... That was really driving kind Katie of Price. Can you imagine Katie Price? How many Katie Price books do you have to read? Unbelievable. Um, you know, it's on the trade side. Yeah. That was really driving uh, sales on the trade side. Now it's it, the non-fiction book has really, um, it's really having a moment, and uh, that can only be good for citizenship. For, for, well, yeah, for, <laughs> for every reason. Yeah, really, you know, but including academic writing. That's well. making me feel so much happier mm. and buoyant in this very, very sad year. Yeah. That's fantastic that actually yeah. good ideas well expressed are finding an audience. Yeah, and I think it's to do with the times we're living through and people trying to make sense of it. Um, wow. yeah. And I think wow. there's some great uh, authors, out, writers out there at the moment. I do too, and, I, and new authors too. We're going to probably talk about that in a sec, but the new authors, the new voices. I'm never a person to go, oh, look, I haven't heard of that person. If I haven't heard of that person, I will read that person because that's something new to explore. We've got some fantastic new writers, I think. Yeah, yeah. And, of course, watching these vlogs, we have PhD students, early career researchers around the world who are part of our community. And, look, I remember when I was, you know, when dinosaurs roamed the earth and I was a young scholar, I used to have to sell my liver sell my small intestine, lose <laughs> several of my append appendices uh, to try and get publishing. I won't even mention the publisher, but there's one publisher that had three, I'll just do the story, three, three referee reports came in, all positive, but the publisher didn't like it, so they went for three more refereed reports that all liked it, and then they went for three more. So one of my books had nine <laughs> referee reports because they were just trying to get rid of it. So it was just an unbelievable story, and I ended up just like, what can I do to make you realise that this is a great book? And you know, finally we got it through, and they apologised six months later, but you know, really difficult conditions. So... Yeah. Do you think, uh, in some ways you've answered it, but I'd be interested in your view on this, do you think it's becoming easier for first-time authors, early career researchers, to, to get that first book through? Because we always have that image, we send the monograph, it's sitting on somebody's desk, will they even read it? So is it easier to get through now? I mean, I would like to think it's getting easier. I mean, talking about the UK situation, we've got this kind of proliferation, the return of the university press here. So there's you know more options for early career researchers trying nice. to get published. Um, I think um, I'd like to think that publishers really recognise the value of early career researchers and publishing their research because that is the lifeblood of the disciplines we're publishing in. Yep. So you need that... Uh, Energy. Need to, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's exactly the right word. And I think these the, these new formats like the, the short books like Emerald Points are really good for early career researchers um, because, uh, you know, talking to um, academics that need to be to have publications on your CV, uh, that journal articles can sometimes take up to two years to get published. Yep. So these short books can publish within three months. So um, uh, I think that's good. That could be a really good format for early career researchers. And you know the, the amount of research, as we were talking about earlier, the, the, the amount of um, information available online and support available online now, and what you do <laughs> for early career researchers. Um, uh, you know, and things like Academic Writing Month on Twitter, yeah. the Thesis Whisperer, all, all those Absolutely. resources. You know, I, I think um, should be, sh I hope, are, are really helping um, yes. them as they're thinking about a publication strategy. But I constantly hear when I'm out on campus uh, that they, they, they still find it difficult. Yeah. Um, and actually, I went to a conference recently and I tried to meet with some people still researching, still doing their PhDs, and I, they didn't particularly want to meet with me, or they, they, they sort of said, oh, I'm not ready, I'm not sort of thinking about that. Maybe they 
weren't sure about how to kind of have that kind of conversation or but they they didn't want to meet with me um and you know that's fine but you know, that's I, madness <laughs> that's I wanted to be able to talk to them about the new series we were doing in their field and just like give them a, a sort of awareness or a heads up of what we were doing when they kind of got to the end of their their, their, their PhD so I would love to know you know what 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 more we can do. We Emerald are very committed to, to publishing the work of early career researchers. Um, and we have resources available online to try and I think there's a lot of unnecessary mystery about the publication Correct. process. And I you know and having been on the, the other side of being a PhD student, I would have the idea of publishing anything from my PhD would have just I might as well be trying to get to the moon. So, yeah. but and be, but being on this side, I, I'm I'm confused about why it seems such a mysterious process. Um, so we have lots of resources online. We're also next year we're publishing a series called Surviving and Thriving yeah. in Academia, uh, aimed at early career researchers. Um, but I I'd love to I'd love to hear what what is it that, that academic, academic publishers need to be doing more of to what's to reach and help early yeah career look researchers. I think what made a difference and this has made a real difference at Flinders is I did a vlog but I've also got a template of this is what a book proposal looks like here are the headings yeah yeah and here's here are just seventeen of my book proposals using those headings well, that's that have amazing. been successful yeah. and the consequences of that is every single one of my PhD students that has finished now has at least one book. Yeah. Sunny Rushavara, Dr. Sunny Rushavara, has two books published in the year after her PhD. Wow, wow. So yeah, I mean, maybe it's more, maybe it's also having a kind of mentor yeah. within academia. Definitely. And also a belief in books too. We've got to sort of stop this nonsense. We've seen less of this in the UK, a fair amount of it in Australia. That dreadful phrase, books don't matter. Oh, okay. I've, I've had senior academics, senior leaders in universities say, oh, look, books don't matter. Oh, right. At the end of your life, the first thing they say, they say is, Tara Brabazon, comma, author of 20 books. That's, that's your first line. Mm. So books matter, knowledge matters in this form. So let's see what the two of us can do to really enable that. But let's defamiliarise it, team. You can get through, you've got a real person here who's a publisher <laughs> who is interested in content interested in high quality ideas, so we can make it work for you. Um, when new authors are approaching you, this is that, this because the hardest thing, I, I work with the students who go, oh, what do I say in the letter? What do I say in the email? And sort of, it's almost at that level, like, oh, what goes wrong in that? What would you recommend to students in that approach to someone like you to Emerald? I would take it a step back, actually, and I think I think what uh, doctoral students at early career research should be doing is networking. A academics as authors are in a really unique position. They have unmediated access to the publisher. They don't have to go through an agent. And there are, all through the year, academic publishers and commissioning editors are out at conferences and academics can go, and they're there, and academics can go and speak to yeah. them. And so I think um, PhD students should be using those opportunities to network yeah. and to do research, which is what they're really good at. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Find out who are the publishers who are happy to consider early career researchers or first book proposals. Yes. What are, who are the publishers who have a focus in their particular area of research or have series in their areas of research crucial you know what are their what are those publishers particular requirements for submission what do their proposal forms look like what do they particularly ask for are they yes. asking for sample chapters for example or yeah. is that not something they particularly need who is the person that commissions in their subject area at the press so so do your research know those yeah. people because there's nothing worse i can imagine people write to you, get your name wrong, or end up in the wrong place, or they end up sending it to the science editor when it's going to you, and so do your homework. Be respectful of the expertise of our publishers, and do your work, and so approach you as a, you know, a, a, a scholar and gentlewoman and publisher and someone <laughs> of ethics and integrity. I mean, publishers, you know? we're renowned for being friendly. Yeah. <laughs> and my favourite thing at a conference is, is if someone comes up to me and says, I have a book proposal that I would like to discuss with you. I'd love to hear that. 
So, you know, I, I think, you know, this sort of reticence, I was thinking about this in this reticence of PhD students to meet me. I think actually, you know, you need to be thinking, what's my publication plan post PhD? And how do I approach this? And who are the people I need to know? Yeah. Um, and I, and I, I think that that would really that would, would be, really help. That would be transformative. Yeah. And the PhD does go quickly. There's all the focus on publishing during it. But I always remember I, I used an interview question that I, I got in Canada, what we used for early career researchers, what's your second book? So it's assumed that your PhD will be your first book. But the question in the interview is, what's your second book? Because that shows you've got a plan. Oh, right. So you yeah, guys yeah. obviously don't want someone who publishes one book in their life. You want someone who is ambitious and has a trajectory and this is where my career is going and will yeah, you... Because you, yeah. you've done all the work on their branding. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, that's the, you know, that's one of the hopes for us. If we can publish the first book, maybe that means we publish the second book. Maybe we, that means we publish the seminal groundbreaking, yep. <laughs> career-defining work further down the line. Yes. You know, and then that's a relationship with, that we can nurture yeah. uh, and, and build. You know, yeah. that's, that's ideal for us. Because th these are relationships of loyalty. That's the one thing I would say to you. And I've found those good publishers that I've mentioned, I've stayed with them a long time. I've often stayed with them till the editor leaves. So it is, it is like a marriage. You stay <laughs> with the person, and then when that person leaves the publisher, then you probably move somewhere else. But it is a relationship of loyalty and integrity and honesty. And really these days we get to actually meet people. We sort of do all the weird email stuff. Yeah. But it is a very, very close relationship and it can last you through your career certainly a decade so it is worth nurturing I mean one other thing mm. I think um, early career researchers need to think about as well is I mean that the PhD is not a book and that there will be work that needs to be done in converting it to a book and there's again there's lots of resources and there lots are. of books written about doing that there are. and it's worth spending some time thinking about how you do that it's not good enough to just submit to your thesis yes. you need to kind of put the work in into, to developing it into a book um, and also if I can just throw in there two good supervisors help their students by actually the, making the thesis more like a book so the reason why my mm. students get through so quickly is because we actually write it like a scholarly monograph so we have an integrated literature oh, review, right. not a literature review chapter. The methods are integrated. So oh, yeah. actually, it's you do make very few changes, probably three, four months' work, and good to go. But that starts right at the start. Do you want this to be a book? And that changes how you supervise that student. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and I think the other thing, which is more difficult, uh, you know, coming from the academic background, is thinking about the market for the book. I think that's yeah. that's one of the hardest things to do. Yes. Um, because as publishers we're obviously trying to reach a global audience yes. for our You've work. You've got to make your money back. <laughs> yeah. uh, there is that aspect to it. Um, so you know when you're when people are when academics are putting their proposal together they need to think about why, you know, how how will the book appeal internationally? Yep. What can be expanded or how can the book be structured so that it has that global appeal? Yeah, exactly right. And again, even if you are thinking right at the start of a PhD, people in the first week and month, right, if you want this to be a book, call it early. That changes how the thesis itself will be constructed and also the modality through which you express it. I always say to them, right, you're writing it for two examiners, that's true, but who else do you want to read it? And that imagined readership transforms how the work itself is researched and structured. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not necessarily, I think, all about going out and doing lots more research, but why, you know, why is your research on Bingley yeah. going to appeal to someone yeah. reading it in Australia? Yeah. What, what is the wider implication? Yes, I, I'm, I'm much less classy than you, so uh, when I'm asking people to write that section of a book proposal, why should I care? Mm. Why should I give it damn? Why should I give it damn? Yeah, the sort of so what... Yeah, that's and if you go, why should I give a damn, and that get a bit provocative, that's what you need, because that's what will sell it. Yeah, yeah. yeah Fantastic. Absolutely. Last question, how brilliant <laughs> have you been? This is amazing. <laughs> I'm just wondering, because you are such an optimistic, buoyant person, are you <laughs> optimistic or pessimistic about the future of academic publishing? Particularly now that you know Amazon is a very mature distribution arm now, I think, and the Kindle and iBooks look pretty stable to my eyes. So are you quite 
optimistic about academic publishing in these multiple modes now? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm hugely optimistic about academic publishing. Um, well, you know, I think that you know, as we've been talking about, we need experts and we need academic research even more than ever. Um, we need um, respected and trusted academic, I don't like this word, but brands yep. um, that, is, that will help that research have impact and reach as, as widely and as possible. And currency and integrity, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think a Amazon are actually very, th th you could, there's lots of reasons to criticise Amazon, but Amazon um, are actually very supportive of academic content. Yes. And we work with them quite closely. Um, and I, you know, I think as we've talked about open access um, and the short form format, you know, digital publishing, um, it's, it's really exciting. I think we probably haven't made the most of it in um, and the opportunities it presents in academic publishing, and there's still more we could do yes. uh, as the technology evolves. Indeed. And remember all those interesting experiments where they were putting sort of video into e Yeah, and absolutely. So that sort of died, that, that, the rich content, that sort of died yeah. a bit, but I wonder if there are other ways to do it. Uh, these, I don't know where that's going to go. Yeah, either. yeah. I think yeah. There's, I think there was initially a lot of of interest in that kind of thing. I think it's hard to make the financial side of that sort of thing work. work. But who knows where where it will go in the future and what might be possible. But but probably having the conventional book, but then having the mixed media or the digital media around it, pointing to that text outside of it, might be the way going forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fascinating. Um, <laughs> I have loved every minute of this conversation. It was <laughs> worth coming to England to speak to this remarkable woman. Philippa, you are amazing. Oh, you are well, amazing. You're amazing. Tom. You're amazing. You're amazing. <laughs> um, and can I say on behalf of everyone at Flinders, or every happiness with your wedding. Oh, we are so you. thrilled for you. And look, we wouldn't mind getting a picture too. We can just send me via email a picture so all the Flinders crew can actually see you. If you're happy to do that, I would love that. Um, I want you to have a wonderful day. Thank um, you. And I'm sure it'll be an amazing marriage after that wonderful day. And, and thank you for everything that you're doing oh. for academics around the world. You are making a difference. Oh, wife. well, that's amazing to hear. So thank you. Thank you to this wonderful woman. And I wish you all, how brilliant was this? I wish you all love light and peace. Tea out. <laughs> wow, that was really fun. How did that feel? It felt it